I was following the path that I was supposed to be following and doing what I was supposed to be doing. It just felt right. And we just thought everything was going perfect. I didn't think he'd live to daylight. I saw him a number of times after that, and I didn't see how he could live. Not another day. This program raises questions. This program is for people who find it hard to trust God. The best answers are wrapped in flesh and blood. My friends, people who are enduring real tragedies every single day. Quadriplegia, muscular dystrophy, stroke, bankruptcy, loneliness, singleness. We're gonna to talk to those very people who have touched my life. Hi, I'm Johnny Erickson Tata, and thanks for joining me as together we take an honest look into the hard questions about God's goodness in a world of suffering. You know, I meet some of the most amazing people. I look at the headaches and the hardships they face, and I wonder, how do they do it? I mean, how can they keep their faith in God? Because it's one thing to submit to His leading and live a Christian life when things are going the way we'd like them to, and even that's not always easy, right? But when suffering enters the equation, when our lives are changed, sometimes forever, in ways that bring hurt and heartache, well then following God becomes a different matter, doesn't it? Well, in this episode, let's go to a small town in Texas to meet Ron and Beverly Huckabee, two special people who traveled a most challenging road. Before the accident, our life was where we thought we would be for the rest of our lives. It was going great. Ron was at his first pastorate. There were 10 people when I came in. But you could tell it was a church full of love. And it grew, it quickly grew. We were averaging 60 and 70 in about three years. And so it, it grew, and that love grew too. He was a very energetic preacher. He was involved in the community. He became known as the do-all preacher, I guess you could say. Uh, he was where the scripture talks about taking care of the elderly. So he was their carpenter, their plumber, their mechanic, whatever they needed, and he just had a compassion for the people, and we just thought everything was going perfect. The way it should go. It just seemed like everything was, uh, I was following the path that I was supposed to be following, and doing what I was supposed to be doing. It just felt right. He had just started motorcycle riding with, his, with our friend again, and he used to ride when we were younger and he was really having a good time. So he called and said that another guy was coming down and they wanted to go to Dallas. Did he want to go? And uh, we headed out and everything was going well. And I don't know exactly what happened. All I know is I lost control. The bike hit the rail and I went over the side of the bridge. As I was laying down there, <laughs> I remember I was conscious. The police officer, off-duty police officer, come up. He expected, I guess he expected me to be dead because when I spoke to him, he stepped back like he was in shock. He was surprised, as surprised, I guess, as I might have been if I'd seen where I'd fallen from. When I got the call from the fireman that he had been in an accident, I thought they were pulling a trick on me. But they said that he had had an accident. He told me that he had a spinal cord injury. So we finally got to Dallas and uh, it was the longest night I ever had. I remember waking up with this hard shell on me, not able to sit up and not able to move and thinking, boy, I've really messed up now. I was so shocked. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to think. I was trying to prepare myself, but nothing could have prepared me. And I don't remember exactly what I said to him, but I told him he was in trouble for messing up and he just kind of kind of grinned at me. I was always daddy's little girl and it was just not easy. And the doctors finally took us in and told us about that it was a complete break in the spinal cord so that at the C5 level so that he would not walk again. The next 
few weeks would be the critical, whether or not he would even, you know, live through it. I didn't think he'd live to daylight, to be honest with you. And then saw him a number of times after that, and I didn't see how he could live. Not another day. There's many days I walked away from the hospital thinking I wouldn't see him again. They told him it was basically up to him. It's normal to think that the diagnosis of a broken neck could be a death sentence, because everything, I mean, absolutely everything looks dark. But Ron did live, and the Huckabee slowly began to see blessings, some positives for which they could be grateful. He may not have his hands and feet, but God, even through that fall, which was a 65 to 70 foot fall, he had no head injury at all. So I knew God, the part that God needed him to use was still intact. So I hung on to that, that God would still be using him or he would have gone home. God had a place for him. God's got a purpose for him. He's got work for him to do. We all know it was God that saved my life. You don't fall 65, 70 feet straight down and live to, to tell about it usually. I just knew that God had taken care of me and didn't take it for granted. God had taken care of him? Does that strike you as odd? Well, maybe, but God did more than just cushion Ron from a worse tragedy in that fall. Because something happened earlier on in Ron's teenage years to prepare him for what lie ahead. I had cancer when I was 17. Started out as testicular carcinoma. Had the left lung, lower lobe of the left lung removed because of the tumor in it. 17 years old, you think you're, you're immortal. I still couldn't believe that I had cancer, that I was about to die. So I was unsaved. I was in the hospital, and uh, it just seemed like the whole room, no matter how bright you get it, it just seemed dark. And then one day I got a letter from Judy Langford, that was the teacher's name, and she said uh, that she was praying for me, and that the whole church was praying for me. And I decided then I wanted to stick around and find out what this was all about. So I began to fight the cancer. I visited the church and got to be a part of their youth group and eventually gave my life to Christ. The whole church about celebrated because they had been praying for me for a long time, not just for my cancer, but for salvation. That smile on Ron's face doesn't happen by itself because there were people. Actually, one special person who was helping Ron from the earliest days when he really needed a friend. With Beverly, she just followed me through it all. She didn't, she never gave any, any discouraging words. She just encouraged me in everything. When my cancer came back, it came back while we were dating. And I remember going into it a, a totally different, that's when they found it in the left lung. And I remember I was saved, I was engaged to be married. So I wasn't worried about the cancer at all. I said, well, whatever God has in store, that's what God has in store. If I, it was a win-win situation. If I die, I go to heaven. If I don't, I've got, my, got heaven here on earth with the woman I love. We got married July 31st, 1981 at Lakeside. We started wanting a child, but through his cancer history, they said, the doctor said that that would probably never happen. God started dealing with Ron then to surrender to the ministry and preach. December 6, 1986, Ron surrendered to the ministry. Nine months later, September 7th, 1987, Elizabeth was born. She was just our little miracle from the very beginning. Yeah, even from the name, Elizabeth Deanne means God's promise of love. And we didn't know that until after we'd already named her. But she was, is God's promise of of love towards us. When Ron came, we had about eight members, all we had here at the church that night. We heard him preach, and when he went out and we voted, it was a unanimous vote 
So he accepted the church and was our pastor from then on until he had his accident. He was a fantastic pastor for us. Our church grew there at, during his time of service. He wasn't just a pastor. I mean, he stayed involved with everything. Youth went on a trip, he was with them. Adults went on a trip, he was with them. And so and that's what, I think that's what made him such a special pastor. He wasn't just for one group, he was for the entire church. He shepherded the whole church. He came home continuing to pastor. Knew that there was a purpose for it, knew that God still had a work for him to do. He still continued to get outside. He would roll down to the church and spend hours down to the church by himself. Somebody would go open the doors and he would just go in and do whatever he needed to do. All that had changed was a wheelchair. It wasn't so bad. We all said as long as he still had his voice, he could still preach. I get a lump in my throat when I hear Ron's daughter say, it wasn't so bad, and that everything will be okay as long as Ron can preach. Maybe that's okay if things stay on an even keel, but it's another story when more problems begin to pile on. Later that summer, he had a problem and ended up back in Baylor for about nine days. And uh, while we were there, we had a very dear friend pass away and that really hit him very hard. And we weren't home from there very long before he ended up back in hospital in Athens. And while he was there, he had developed pneumonia, which diminished his lung capacity. And so he couldn't speak for very long without running completely out of air, not being able to breathe very well. And that's when he started having a change in his attitude also. Well, he wasn't the jovial Ron. He wasn't the, uh, I've got this to do Ron. I can do this Ron. He started becoming, I can't do Ron. He felt like he couldn't do anything. He felt like he was useless, uh, a burden. And depression had started to set in then. Well, he thought he was going to improve and walk and, you know, be back to normal. Then when the reality of it set in that he was not going to be normal, he was not going to walk, then that depression, that just spiral downward set in. I never realized how deep depression could get. Ron got to the point where he would go a week, two weeks at a time and never even get out of bed. You know, he just got to more physically to where he just didn't feel like doing anything and so wouldn't speak, wouldn't talk. The depression was just, I mean, it changed him completely. He was such a different person and never talked, always laid in the bedroom by himself, never wanted to be around anybody. And it was really especially hard for me because it was always me and dad, you know? I mean, we always did everything. I think the trips to the hospital and not being able to do things they used to do, the changes all just came flooding in, I guess you might say. And all of a sudden I realized I couldn't do it anymore. Couldn't preach full time anymore and it was devastating. Felt like everything I'd ever worked for, ever hoped for was fading away. Cause it's, it was what I lived for, just to preach the gospel and share with others. And it just felt like everything was slipping away. It can kill. Depression can kill if you do not do something about it. It can hit anybody even the strongest of people you think they are. It can come in, creep in and hit anybody. Uh, I'd have never thought it would have hit so hard. It just takes all your drive. You don't have any drive, any energy or anything. You don't have no, no want to do of anything. It takes away all your hope, all your dreams. He just began to withdraw and he just about gave up completely. I just wanted to die, I didn't want to live. I just wanted to die. It's like a bad nightmare. You, did, you could look at him and just, you knew you still had to give him the strength and ask for God to give him the strength to pull him out of this because he didn't want to do nothing but lay there and die. Often 
things work to good for those who love God. And I just tried to keep repeating that over and over and believing it. Depression, that dark and deep, is so numbing. And sometimes you need to be jolted by something that's jarring enough to shake you back into reality, to wake you up. Well, God must have known that because you will never believe what happened next. A friend of mine had given us a tape with Johnny Erickson Tata and uh, wanted me to watch it. She was being interviewed by Larry King Live. So I watched the tape and uh, I was impressed because she was in about the same shape as I'm in. And I emailed her after that. I got on the internet and found out some information and I emailed her. Couldn't tell you a thing I wrote in that email. I'll tell you what Bev emailed me. I have it right here. She says, Dear Johnny, I am at a loss. My husband Ron will not get out of bed. He doesn't talk. And if he answers a question, he only says, I don't know. He doesn't want to live anymore. And he doesn't care about our family. We seem to be falling through the cracks. We need help. Well, help was on the way. That evening after I emailed, her assistant called and said that Johnny would be calling Ron tomorrow if that was okay. She got Ron on the telephone and uh, decided that because he was a pastor, she would start off with some scripture. And so she quoted scripture with him and discussed it with him. And on the other end of the phone, there was nothing, just silence. And so she decided, well, maybe what I'll do is uh, sing to Ron. Maybe, maybe that would warm him up. She sang this beautiful hymn to him over the phone and got a little grunt, nothing more. And so she thought, well, uh, Ron, let's pray. And she prayed with him. And at the end of it, nothing happened. Just dead silence. And so she was thinking, what can I do for Ron? And suddenly a picture passed through her mind. And of all things, it was a scene from the Shawshank Redemption. It's the, that famous scene where Old Red, who has been in prison for decades, is talking to the new guy who has been given life. And he says, Andy, hope is a good thing. In fact, it may be the best of things. And in these circumstances, you've got to wake up in the morning and either decide to get busy living or get busy dying. Ron, she said, there's 10,000 quadriplegics that tomorrow morning are going to have to make that decision. You got to either get busy living or get busy dying. And she just kind of put it blunt. And uh, I decided then I wanted to get busy living. As she was talking to him, I could see a light sparkling in his eye again. And slowly but surely, he started to come around. She invited him to the camp, and I asked, and he hadn't been willing to do anything. I asked him if he wanted to go, and he said, yeah, I do. Let's try it. And I am so glad Ron decided to come to camp. That is our Johnny and Friends family retreat. I remember telling him there, Ron, there are 10,000 other quadriplegics like you and me who've got to decide every day whether or not to get up out of bed. I I'm just glad that now you want to get busy living. And I tell you, when he came to family retreat, you, you should have seen him. There he was, fishing at the lake, dancing in that wheelchair of his, hugging me, hugging everybody. I, I think the best part was just watching him be with other disabled people who are busy really living. You could see the hope of Jesus overflowing through his smile at our Johnny and Friends family retreat. It was awesome. What a change. That's what family retreats are. They're about people who say that life is over and they come there and they see, whoa, they see a horizon. They, they don't see the edge of the cliff and they, and they say, no, life's not over. Uh, matter of fact, it might have only just begun. I have opportunity to reach others now that I never reached before through the chair, through the testimony of what happened and how God lifted me up and is using me now. So he gave me a greater testimony. I believe Johnny was the answer prayer that Ron needed. Of course, things are different. 
but Ron has has got a spirit about him that he wants to overcome. He wants to get through, and I see dedication that I don't see in a lot of people that don't have any difficulties. Just like Johnny said, get busy living or get busy dying. It's time to come out of it and just know that the Lord will supply your every need and take care of you. He'll give you the strength to go day by day if you'll just trust Him. It amazes me how, how someone can go through so much and just be, just enjoy life, be able to enjoy life. There should not be any doubt in anyone's mind that God has a place for him. If he didn't have a place for him, he didn't have a work for him, then he would have died that first night. He'd have died 25 years ago. In the afternoon, I work for Marketplace Ministries, and I spend a couple hours with a prayer list that I pray over each day. I've received calls from Puerto Rico. I've received calls from Michigan, just all over. I've received calls from people who wanted prayer and just prayed with them over the phone. It's exciting to be back in the pulpit. I preach once a month. He's just been an inspiration to us, you know, to see somebody to go and do like he's done. I just didn't know if I could ever do that or not, you know, being in circumstances, but he's been marvelous. He's given me hope. He, with everything that he's gone through, I mean, I don't know anybody that's gone through anything worse, you know? And he's given me hope that no matter what life throws at you or what Satan throws at you, God's always there to bring you through it. God's not finished with me. He's still got big plans for Ron, just like he had when he gave him cancer. Ron didn't think so, but he found out later he did. And he's got big plans for him now. It's different plans, but he's got big plans for Ron. Even though this was a tragedy and a change in our lives, I know great things are going to come of it. And Jeremiah 29 and 11 is the, one of the first scriptures we learned from our first visit to camp. And then it says, I know, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper and to use you. And I know that God has got plans to use Ron. He's a sovereign God. He's in control no matter what circumstances, no matter what situation. He's in control of everything that happens. And he has a plan and a purpose for me, for everyone that will trust him and follow him. There you have it quite a story. But I want to take a minute to talk about the verse Bev Huckabee just mentioned, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Isn't it odd that Beverly should choose that verse? I mean, she, she boasts in the Lord's plans for her husband plans to prosper him and not to harm him, plans to give Ron hope and a future. It's like, what? <laughs> but let's take a reality check. The context of this verse is absolutely striking. It's part of a letter written by the prophet Jeremiah and placed into the hands of the Israelites who were being dragged off into exile, into slavery in Babylon. The downtrodden Israelites not only faced a prison march across the desert, but once they arrived in Babylon, they were pressed into forced labor. So how in the world could Jeremiah write to them and say, God's not going to do anything to harm you. Why, you've got hope. You've got a real future. Come on, living as an exile in slavery? That's God's idea of a great plan? a hopeful future? Yet God gave this invigorating and encouraging promise to actually inspire the captives. First, God wanted to tell them not to lose heart because one day things would get better. The Lord would deliver them. And secondly, and this is really important, God's idea of good 
often has less to do with our outward circumstances, whether it's slavery for the Israelites or quadriplegia or cancer for Ron Huckabee. It has less to do with external things and more to do with what's on the inside. God is concerned about changing our heart, changing our character, literally transforming us from the inside out. And suffering is often his choice's tool to do just that. Did you see the courage in Ron and Bev's faces? Did you hear the perseverance in their voices and see the victory in their smiles and their eyes? That is the main focus. Now certainly God's heart goes out to anyone with quadriplegia or cancer, but he has something deeper, something richer and more full of meaning in mind for all of us. God may not keep pain or disappointment or even an accident or an injury away from your door. And I will be honest, it's hard. Even Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But God's purpose is to make Ron and Beverly and me and you become more like Christ. So what is the hope and the future all about? The hope Beverly Huckabee was smiling about when she mentioned Jeremiah 29? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's the meaning, that, that's the richness. And that is worth any amount of suffering. And if you don't believe me, dig deeper for yourself into Jeremiah 29, or just remember my friends, the Huckabees, in that sleepy little town in South Texas. <laughs>